This is Secrets to Win Big, your roadmap to sustained growth. Brought to you by Arjun Sen, founder and CEO of Zen Mango, top brand growth driver and a former Fortune 500 executive who has been called one of the most marketing intelligent minds in the business. Find him at zenmango.com. And now, here's your host, Arjun Sen. Hi. Welcome to Secrets to Win Big with Arjun Sen. This is Arjun, and I have the best seat in the house because I get to ch- get a chance to talk to incredible guests who are leaders from all walks of life from all over the world. The all walks of life and all over the world, I've realized over the years is very important because in life's journey, none of us have the same starting point, none of us have the same destination, and even the path that we each choose are different. So in that spirit today, it's a pledge, personal pleasure to invite my VIP guest, Kyle Smith. I met Kyle and his incredible wife at a conference, and I realized that this is a person I need in my core friend circle for the rest of my life, and that is the impression this man with his heart and his brains made on me, and especially the heart first. So, so sharing a little bit about my friend Kyle is Kyle Smith is the CEO and president of Real Precision Manufacturing, where has, he has successfully led the business over the last 15 years. Kyle did his PhD in solid state chemistry from Brown University and thrives at the intersection of business and science and technology. He always wins by putting himself in positions to work with cross-functional and multicultural teams, leading groups to significant accomplishments and doing everything with energy, intensity, and integrity. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you, Arjun. It's good to see you. So, Kyle, first and foremost, you know, amazing career. Congratulations. And I don't want to ask you the obvious question. I want to go really behind the scene and understand a little bit about big success. I want to go to real precision manufacturing, and I want to go back to the origin. And again, I only want public domain information that you're comfortable sharing. Anything else you want to share, of course, it'll be cool, and I would love to hear. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's look at 2006. You joined the company. What were some of the biggest challenges for you internally for the company, and how did you overcome them? Sure. Um, you know, I think one of the things that always impresses me is uh, kind of what, and I didn't think about this early in my career, but the fact that companies have kind of a, a culture, whether they intend it or not, it definitely has a culture in it. And so it wasn't the what the company did so much that attracted me was the how they did it. And it was very clear to me that how they did things was very important to them, not just in a placard on the wall or a statement on a PowerPoint, but they really tried to live it out. And that was very attractive. Um, So that's kind of what got the initial discussion starting. Um, But there was also clearly some challenges too. And financially, they were not healthy. I think the fact that even though I valued the foundation of the company, of how they valued people, that very thing also engendered some uh, entitlement. So I think the two biggest problems, one on the business side, was they didn't have a clear idea. They'd lost some focus on what kinds of customers can you serve and serve well. And so that customer profile and the markets that uh, come with that was a big piece of it. And so I tightened that down very, um, (laughs) very uh, dramatically. And I knew the revenue was going to go backwards for a little while, um, but our profitability would increase. And so uh, while you want to have missions and purpose of a company, one of my favorite sayings is no margin, no mission. And you can't do wonderful things and impact the world if you're not profitable. So um, being an ESOP company, uh, and I know you had Patty on uh, roughly a month ago. So uh, ESOP companies kind of are uh, uh, have a culture of their own. But this idea that it will benefit everyone, I think, was part of the uh, goodness in the company in terms of why we want to do things. And relating the whys, I think, are very important to get engagement. So we kind of tightened up the customer profile, uh, who we could serve well. And then on the cultural side, I think business challenges are easy compared to changing cultures. (laughs) And thankfully, the board gave me uh, enough time. And I had a good leadership team that I built over the next uh, couple of years. And uh, we were able to retain the good parts, but we also had to say, look, it's not about any one of us, including myself, it's about the entirety. And our constituencies also include, you know, other things like obviously customers are absolutely vital. 
uh, our community, our suppliers, and um, and certainly our shareholders. And so trying to broaden the scope, I think we got a little inwardly focused um, and those are painful changes to make. And it was not uh, a linear path and one that was without some heartache. But uh, those were the two main things of just trying to pull up a little bit from the entitlement side and then also refocus the business. So let me go back to culture. You joined and based on 15 years and going stronger, you were ready for a relationship, not a date. <laughs> and that's, you know, your actions prove that. So for some of us, when we are listening to you, when you, like, how did you gauge the culture? Like, what were some of the green flags that were, you saw that made you feel, you know, this is the place where I want to commit. And, you know, it's a big decision. You brought your family over, yes, the kids yes. grew up there. It's a big decision that you took. What were the, how do you judge the culture? Well, I, I certainly, um, it resonated with me that uh, kind of the heartbeat was around people. And I do think uh, no matter what your position in life is, and no matter where you reside uh, in the world, I think each individual has an innate value that is there. And they also have great purpose and abilities to contribute. And obviously there's a big diversity of how that plays out. But I think the fact that the company saw people as having innate value and they weren't just a cog to um, extract goodness from and then create profits and then um, you know, use them until they're no longer needed. And so there was this idea of a long-term trajectory, not only for the business, but also for people with a desire to see them grow and develop. And uh, the purpose of the company is really around that more than it is on the products. And so I think, you know, it's just easy, uh, and I've been there myself, where you get the means and the end mixed up. And I think while the, you have to have profitability, back to my no margin, no mission, um, you have to have your priorities straight, both personally as well as a company, so that you can get there in a meaningful way and sustain it. And so some of the things that I did on the culture, if it was a turnaround situation where, you know, it was being cleaned up to sell it or something else, you attack those things differently. Uh, this company had a long-term trajectory. There is no plan to uh, do those other things. And so they wanted a company that was healthy, both financially as well as culturally. And that was very attractive to me because I think how you deal with things, uh, whether it's very short-term or long-term really changes your, um, you know, how you go about doing those things. And, and having a clear sense of priorities from the board of directors all the way through the company is incredibly hard to get, but I think that's critical to success, uh, success as well. So when you came in, there was a decent amount of things that stayed, but a lot of things changed. Over the years, as the company evolved, how do you stay motivated? Is the same thing doing little better? A lot of it is maintenance because those two are very unique skills. And some of us get bored, and I'll give an example from the consumer packaging is the difference between Coke and Pepsi. Pepsi is the child who needs to change hair color every year. Like, I don't know why they need to change logo, but they do. So Coke on the other side is the same boring, trusted Coke that you have. So how can you be both? How can you came in as the Pepsi then became the Coke all through? Yeah, that's a really good insight, Arjun. Um, the, uh, I think there's always that mix and, and I always think about it in sales terms of hunters and farmers. And it's rare when somebody is an excellent hunter and also an excellent farmer because they're just two different dispositions. So for me, it kind of goes back to having a team because none of us, especially myself, can do it all yourself. And so as you think through what are the things that need to change um, technology-wise, business-wise, uh, sales channels, et cetera, who do I have that's going to kind of um, break new ground and do it in a different way because we need to do that in order to stay vital and the revitalization of the company so that it's vibrant going out and not just doing the same things. And there's also some other things uh, that you don't want to change. And so simple example of that is we have kind of two documents and they're posted on our website and they're kind of our foundational documents that kind of give us, doesn't give you answers, but it gives you priorities of what's important and how we want to do business. And I think those are examples of something that uh, I have zero desire or need to change. And yet on top of that, how you do business as the world, because the world's changing every single day. And so if you think you can, you know, even though we've had success, we can't rely on that tomorrow and next month and the year after, because 
you know, things like a pandemic happen and <laughs> that wasn't in the plan. And so you better be facile and be able to change on a dime as you need. And that's where those deep roots, having those foundational things that you know you don't wanna change. And yet there's other things at, that do need to change. And so form and function are kind of two different things. And I think it's easy to get those mixed up where how you do things uh, start becoming what the foundation is. And sometimes you have to kind of prune back and say, no guys, here's the bedrock and here's the principles. How we do those may change over time, but having that foundation clear and um, clearly spelled out for everyone where it's an accountability process, I think that's very, very healthy. I love that. So now you talk about the intersection of business and science and technology. You're a PhD. And so how did you get from there to this area, which is a thriving, like I'm looking at if, if Kyle Smith was a plant, the instructions would be plant the, keep this planted in the intersection. So how did this incredible scientist from solid state chemistry from Brown University get to this intersection? Um, yeah, I think one of the things that I'm always uh, humbled by when you look back and people are at different intersections in your life. And, and obviously, you know, our meeting in Washington was one of those intersections where I didn't plan that. It, it happened. You were slated to be there as one of the uh, seminal speakers at that particular thing. And so I knew, but I'd never met you. And, and I think you can look back in life and it's easy to say, oh, I've got this nice linear path that I've constructed and I've been driven and blah, blah, blah. And there are parts of that. You do need to plan. You do need to I believe, uh, be very diligent and uh, whether it's in sports or business, I don't think you get there by um, just kind of coasting along. I think you have to uh, work diligently to get there. And I think there's clearly um, things that happen through life that I didn't plan, maybe didn't even deserve, both good and bad. But I think those things kind of leave their imprint. And uh, so, my first couple of years at uh, Eastman Kodak and the research labs, it was kind of a dream come true. I was doing fundamental science. I was happy and just in my lab coat with my little Walkman on at the time. And, and uh, it was great. I was just doing, but somewhere along the way, I started wanting to see more application. And there clearly was application because they weren't doing science just for the sake of science. And so we're doing medical imaging and that gave me great um, sense of satisfaction knowing that some of my research would eventually help in those areas, and it did. Um, but there was also a point where I, I, and I didn't do anything to deserve this, but I got asked to be an assistant to the, um, one of the key leaders in the medical um, division within Kodak. And that changed my life in, in essence, in terms of career uh, change. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I've been living in this very narrow, very deep well of science. And I love that. I still do love science. I read papers all the time that you know, would bore other people to death. Um, but having that opportunity really allowed me to say, oh, wow, well, there's a big world out there. There's supply chain, there's HR, there's all these different disciplines that you need to run a company. And that really, uh, really infected me with the business bug. And it really um, excited me as well, because it was seeing all of these different disciplines. And that's kind of where this whole team and thirst for creating good teams that can work well with common objectives and purpose uh, really kind of started to take root. And I really, um, I still look back and I uh, appreciate Clyde Crawford at the time giving me that opportunity. I have no idea why he picked me, but because <laughs> he had lots of people to pick from and I was kind of a greenhorn and wet behind the ears in every which way you can imagine. And uh, so I'm sure he put up with a lot to get me there. But on the other hand, I'm very appreciative. And those are the kind of things that kind of change your trajectory through life. I think, you know, two follow-up thoughts I have. One is when you talk about the example, you got the chance because somebody saw potential in you. And that I think is so incredible that as we are all listening, we all should be grateful and thankful to those amazing individuals who saw what we are capable of that we ourselves didn't see at times. I'm an engineer in aerospace, was all set to do my MBA with operations focus, everything. When a professor from Finland, Hickey Rene, my marketing professor, after my first paper, took me to his office and said, oh, that's the best paper ever. And coming from India, I realized that's what teachers tell you before they drop you. Okay, that's like sarcasm. Okay, that's like the worst paper ever is coming right after. 
And this man wouldn't give up. He even started praising me where every student writes 20 pages, I do one page. And he didn't know I was a poor student. I could afford to pay only for one page. I couldn't afford the 10 pages. And that was my secret. But at the end of one and a half semester, I started believing in him. And my life changed because of Hickey. And I would have even, it's like, I would have never known what marketing meant to me mm. without that one man. But I want to go back to you and I connecting. So in life, we connect, there are intersections. Sometimes there are ideas you take and you build, but then there are times you cannot chase every shiny penny. So how do you find that balance on one side to evolve, but on the other side, you say, you know, it's a cool idea, but it's not for me. Yeah, that's where I think, you know, knowing yourself and what you're about um, is kind of critical to parse that out. Because as you said, you can't chase everything that comes across your path. Um, I always just kind of visualize it in my head of concentric circles. And, you know, at the very core of it is for, for me is like faith, family and friends. And then they kind of go out from there. I've got lots and lots of acquaintances that I would be happy to help. And I'm always, you know, and I try to remember them in different ways. And I think those are important intersections, but they're very from the closer group of friends that you with and you're there for them. And, and you may not talk a lot, but you know that if you pick up the phone or send them a text, they're gonna be back to you in a short amount of time saying, tell me where, what, where and how, and I'll be there for you. And I think that's that tighter intersection. So there may not be family uh, because obviously family's family and that's blood and that's the way it, you know the world mm -hmm. spins. But those close friends that you know, um, that, and, and they may be very, very different than you. And I really love that part of when someone's quite different from me and maybe they've got a different view on something. To me, that adds richness, especially when they're that close because you can share your, dis and that's one of the things that I uh, causes me concern just in general in society that we can't share our concerns in a way that engages as opposed to dividing. <laughs> and um, so for me, that concentric circle as it goes out all those people are valuable and I would always want to help them. But then there's that inner core and that's where you just know, like the evening we walked away and Diane and I walked away from dinner that night. I was like, I'm going to stay in touch with Arjun. <laughs> and it's just, you just kind of know, I don't know how that works exactly, but you know, when you cross a path with someone that you just kind of are kindred spirits with. And also, as you're describing, you know, there's a smirk on my face because I'm looking at Kyle Smith describing his personal loyalty program. Okay, it's like if you were an airline, I have this platinum people, then I have the next circle, like, and it's all about growing more. And I love the way you talked about that all your platinum members don't all have to be exactly the same. Like you don't all have to have the same haircut, everything. Like it's the differences within that. Like to me, I love the way you described it. That's sheer brilliance. So Kyle, now let's change the conversation a little bit. So where do you see Kyle evolve, the leader in future, five years, 10 years, where, where are you going? Yeah, um, there may be more of those intersections we talked about, Arjun, who knows? Um, that's a good question, quite honestly, I'm kind of grappling with that. Um, I do think that CEOs have kind of a shelf life and I watch some CEOs, in my opinion, overstay their welcome in the sense of, you know, they, they make good contributions. And I'm very, very proud of, you know, uh, hopefully what I um, will uh, leave behind at Real. But I also know that there's other people that are very talented and very skilled and they'll bring new things. And that's part of that revitalization and no one person can see everything. And so at some point, and I don't know when exactly that's gonna be, um, I have zero desire to retire to a life of leisure. That's just not very appealing to me. And I don't even, um, I'm not even sure how healthy that is. I would like some more flexibility probably to do things like, you know, spending time. I've got a new granddaughter um, and they live in a different city. And so spending more time with family and having flexibility to do that is a high priority. Um, I think giving back. Uh, so you've got all these things and, and a lot of them you don't really deserve. Um, but I've got had lots of really interesting experiences in life. And I'd like to be able to have a way to give back, I mean, whether that's and you know, an organization or multiple organizations, uh, that would give me a lot of satisfaction to be able to leverage that in a way that kind of promotes some good in the world. Um, and uh, so 
I don't have an exact plan yet, but those are some of the things that come across my mind with that question. Absolutely. And you know, to me, I think, as you talked about earlier, and I'm taking notes like as fast as I can, don't get the means and the ends all mixed up. Mm -hmm. I really think that you have a clear idea about the destination where you want to be, you and Diane, Faith, grandkids, being mentally active, having time. I really think that knowing you, you will find the best path for you, both of you to get there. And I really know it would be incredible. So now I want to take it to a totally different random place. If you walked in to this bar or a coffee place, whatever your choice is, and all of a sudden you meet these two people, they both look somewhat familiar. But then you realize one is Kyle at 16 and one is Kyle at 100. And you guys have an amazing conversation. Like, what would that conversation look like that night? Oh, uh, well, Arjun, you have the flair for uh, just incredible insights as to how to frame things. But yeah, that's a super intriguing question, I think. Um, uh, Kyle at 16 was um, very, very driven. And, you know, my two loves were science already at that point, as well as music. And those were really big forces in my life at that point. And uh, Kyle at 100, um, I don't think I'll see 100, by the way. But <laughs> um, I think, obviously, you're more, I think, the further you go through life. And some of the things that were incredibly important to me at 16 um, are probably going to change over that time frame, uh, getting back to like family and stuff like that. Family has always been important. And I was blessed to be raised in a really great family. Um, but I think Kyle at 100 would be telling the current Kyle, uh, make sure that you plan and don't, you know, stay in the in the middle of the grind where you have fewer uh, options and flexibility points. Don't stay in that too long because you you don't know how long you have relative to being healthy and enjoying life and detours happen. And so don't look back with regret on spending time with family and doing things um, that you really think might have a longer lasting uh, impact on society and so forth. So um, that would be quite an interesting conversation for sure. <laughs> I love that. And thank you for sharing. So Kyle, this has been fascinating. You know, so is there anything we haven't talked about that you would love to share with our listeners? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, I get the um, privilege of being able once a semester, being able to to an MBA class at a local university. And, and I always remind, and these are you know very bright, driven, very accomplished people are gonna go on and do big things in life. I always remind them is, you know, know yourself and what's important. And I can't, no one else can do that for you, but know what energizes you and what depletes you. And it doesn't mean that you stay away from the things that deplete you because all of us have things in life that you're like, yeah, okay, I'm not so keen on like paying bills. That's just kind of a drain, right? I mean, who wants to do that? It's kind of boring, and but it's a necessary part of life. So it doesn't mean you stay away from those, but know what energizes you and then try to line up the things that you're doing to do that in a way that doesn't you know, grind you down because um, yeah, it's like going into a coal mine and just shoveling all day long versus finding something you really enjoy. And it doesn't mean they're not hardship for challenges, but I think if you can do something that you feel is fulfilling and gives you purpose, then that really provides a, an amount of energy and zest for life that's hard to get otherwise. And so, um, yeah, I think that would just be, you know, make sure that you're doing something or at least on a trajectory to do something that you feel is worthwhile and energizes you along the way. To me, I love that. To me, there's a framework I'm trying to work on. And I think you just gave me a lot of content around it. What I realized is, look, not, sorry, Every person can play in one dimension, which is an x-axis. I'm good at something for which people pay me. Then some of us from one of many go to one of few, which is add a y-axis, which is I do it with passion. Mm -hmm. Then there are a few who have the last axis. If I was in India, I would have said Z, and now Z. I see, <laughs> which is they get a kick out of making an impact in others' lives. Mm. And I really think that as you were talking about, I could see that framework, but I saw more content around it because I really think that is so important is you have to be good because if I was having fun and trying to make an impact was totally bad, 
at doing anything. <laughs> could not even hire me. Okay, I want to be a fly pilot. I do not even know where where to take the left turn or the right turn when I get into the plane. So, it, so I really think that sequence is important. So, Kyle, this has been fascinating. So, of course, you have answered every question. It's only fair I give you this chance. Anything you want to ask me? I think I've never thought about that question about 16 current and 100. And so I would be just fascinated to hear what Arjun would say to that question. You know, I've asked this question so many times, nobody has asked me. So, <laughs> you know, I'll just walk in. First of all, I would thank Arjun 16 because I would say, guy, you know, man, you were not the smartest but you kept me in the game, okay? Like you could have done stupid things that could have got me out of the game, okay? So whatever you did, I got the learning, everything, but it's like the game didn't end because of something you did and thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then I would ask the 100 year old, I said, you know, with respect, sir, how did you get from where I am to where you are? Mm -hmm. And is there anything I could make the journey more fun? Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I really feel that that's the wisdom I want to know. Like if I could get that man to retrace back and tell me, you know, Arjun, these are the shiny pennies that will come your way. Do not fall for that. It would be such an amazing thing from learning from that person. Like to me, it's like each one of us have learned from the mistakes that, or the temptations that we have not succumbed to, the mistakes that we have overcome, life will be much easier if somebody told us, hey, there's a pothole coming ahead. Okay, I know, I just get, so that would be my answer. Again, thanks for asking. I've never answered that question. So yeah, you. that's very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Kyle. It was absolutely fascinating. And you have left me with a dilemma. I do not know what to name this. And my two front runners are knowing yourself or entirety focus. So that way I really have to start thinking about it. But this has been an incredible conversation. And one thing I want to share with the audience is when I met Kyle, and even in this conversation, there's a phrase Kyle uses more than I think anything else, because I tabulate, you know, tab words or phrases. The phrase that he uses very often is don't deserve it. Knowing Kyle, he is not being hard on himself. He is not lacking confidence. But to me, I really, it has really hit home that the journey forward is with confidence, but appreciating life with humility. And that's the gift that you have, that you give all, all of us every day. So Kyle, thank you again for your time and truly appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun. I appreciate it too. Thank you. You've been listening to Secrets to Win Big with Arjun Sen, founder and CEO of Zen Mango, top brand growth driver and a former Fortune 500 executive who has been called one of the most marketing intelligent minds in the business. To learn more, visit www.zenmango.com. Share this podcast with your friends and subscribe wherever you like to listen to podcasts. 